Atheists like to bring up a lot when they're talking with a theist or a Christian in particular, and they call it an argument from ignorance. When you're arguing from ignorance. Now, what they don't realize is often they themselves have tons of arguments from ignorance. Because whenever they start talking about the theology of the Bible, or, or you know, the God of the Old Testament, you know, 99% of the time they're arguing from ignorance. They don't understand God and they don't understand the theology and they don't really want to. So they're arguing from ignorance. Now there's another example of an argument from ignorance that I was made aware of recently. I was watching this show, watching this lecture with uh, Richard Dawkins. And he goes, you know, obviously there isn't a create an intelligent designer because the universe is so flawed. And he's like, I mean, just look at planets. There's so much waste. Planets are exploding and bumping into other planets, and there's so much chaos out there in the universe that it, that it you know, there couldn't possibly be an intelligent designer. And I'm thinking, ha, huh, argument from ignorance. Look at right there. That's the biggest argument from ignorance I've ever heard. And the argument from ignorance is kind of radical ignorance. It's like, I have no idea, you know, why there could be some meaning to that. Hence, there cannot be a complete and an absolute argument from ignorance. In other words, what Richard Dawkins did, okay, and what we all do from time to time, when, I, when, when we talk about arguing from ignorance, let's just start this right from the, from the jump, let's just say, we all do it. Me, the Christian, you, the atheist, we are always constantly arguing from ignorance. It's part of the, it's part of the human condition. You don't know anything about God, and, and even the stuff we do know about science or philosophy or sociology is very, 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 very limited. You know, the Bible says now we, we see through a glass darkly. That's intending to tell you, the Christian, that we are always kind of arguing from ignorance. We see through a glass darkly. We barely understand. Now, Christians should take heed of that scripture a lot more frequently so they wouldn't, you know, come across as Mr. High and Mighty and I know everything. But atheists could learn from that too because that is the best way to view your knowledge. Any knowledge that you attain, that is the absolute best way you can perceive it. As partially rooted in ignorance, as incomplete, as not very much information in the overall scheme of things. Now, that's for me too. It's not just for you, the atheists. That's for both of us. One way I like, we, the, the scripture that backs it up, for the Christian, now we see through a glass darkly. That means we barely see it all, if a little. You know, and if you, the atheist, want to use that in your next argument with the Christian, you know, be my guest. Be my guest. Say, look, you're acting like you know it all. Your own Bible says, now you see through a glass darkly. In other words, you barely know anything. Do it. You know, you have my blessing. Um, but, so the point. Another way that I would, I would make an analogy about how little we know and how little is known of God is pretend there is a library with five floors and 500,000 books in it. We have walked into the first floor of the library and we have gone to the first shelf of the first floor and we've together read about 10 books. That's where we're at in our conversation, both you and me, in terms of scientific knowledge and in terms of knowledge of God. There is a library with 5,100 volumes in it, five floors. We're on the first floor, the first shelf. And we've worked through maybe three shelves. We've read maybe 50 books. So neither of us know everything. Let's just start from there. Neither of us know everything. And yeah, fine, okay, me too. I'll put me in there too. It's not really true of me, but, you know, for argument's sake, let's say I'm included in this general level of ignorance. Let's include me in it for argument's sake. It's not really true. I know a lot, but whatever. Put me in there if you want to. So Richard Dawkins' concept of, of what a divine being, in his concept of a perfect being perfectly realizing a life, there could be no waste or no appearance of waste. Now that's completely ignorant. That's completely and utterly ignorant. And one of the things I'm arguing with another guy on a different thread is that 
perhaps our very concept of perfection is limited in scope. God is a perfect being. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. Perhaps the, the, the sickness and the sorrow and the vulnerability and the things that we see in this life that look like frailty, that look like incompletes or mistakes, is part of perfection in execution, is part of the point. What we see in this world, its troubles and sorrows, is perfection in execution that we do not understand at all. By way of analogy, let me offer you this story that I'm working on, okay? It's in rough shape, so bear with it. Let's pretend there's a guy, and let's call him Vincent Van Gogh. And let's say he's surprisingly similar. My character that I'm inventing right now off the top of my head is surprisingly similar to a guy who actually existed. And let's say Vincent Van Gogh, you know, is kind of a dirtbag. He, he drinks a lot, a lot, a lot. He drinks a drink called absinthe. Green liqueur makes him half crazy. If you went down the street in your town today and you see him on the street, he'd be kind of a, half a homeless guy. He'd be ranting incoherently about this or that. He'd smell wouldn't have bathed in five days, you know? You don't like him. You go, oh, that guy again. He's going to talk to me about, like, you know, the, how they're poisoning the water supply. And he rants and raves, and he's half incoherent, and he hasn't bathed in five days, and he's, he's really, really just, he, you, he irritates you no end. A flawed human being, if ever there was a flawed human being, as flawed a human being as you could possibly imagine, so much so that you can barely stand to be, to be in his company for longer than 20 minutes because he drives you nuts. Keep in mind, this is an actual human being, and that's not that far off from how he actually would have been were you to run into him in real life. Now you're walking through a garden, and you see this same scuzzy homeless guy. He's got an eat in front of him. Same guy. Same exact person that, you know, half an hour ago, you were like, get me away from this guy. He's, he's completely nuts. He's sick. He's weird. Same exact guy. And you walk in, you're like, oh, this guy again. You walk up to the Itza, and you're like, what? What is that? And you see what he's painting. And you're like, my gosh. That's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So you see where I'm going with this. Perhaps flaws in reality are pointing towards perfection and execution. That God is doing something. That the flaws in our nature, that the suffering of this world, that the, the sickness and the sorrow and the sadness of this world are part and parcel of the whole thing. A part of the whole design. And it's perfect in execution. And we just cannot understand it. Another way of looking at it, let's look at suffering in this world. Let's take the book of suffering in, in, in the Old Testament where they try to wrestle with suffering and sorrow in this world, the book of Job. Because Job's concept is very, very similar to what I just said. Job is a really, really good guy. Okay, he's a really good man. And one day God is sitting, on a, sitting, sitting up there in heaven and the devil, yeah, the devil comes up to God. And he's like, let me, you know, let me mess with Job. He loves you now, but let me take away all his stuff. Let me, let me smite him. Let me do all these terrible things to him. Then he's going to turn around. He's going to spit in your face. Here is the most important part of the text. God says to him, okay, but go this far and no further. Go this far and no further. Why is that the most important part of the text? Because all of the suffering and the sorrow of this world, all of it, every single minute of it, has a beginning and it has an end. It has an end. All of it. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. That is very, very, very important. It is temporal in nature. It is not eternal. God is calling to you, you to a place that is eternal, that goes on forever and ever, and it has no beginning, it has no middle, and it has, most importantly, no end. It goes on forever and ever and ever and ever, and there is no sickness, no sorrow, no suffering, and no death. None. Forever. Forever. 
The sickness of this world, the Bible says the, the sickness of this world, the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory to be revealed. Not worthy. Not worth discussing. Because it is temporal. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. Even something like the Holocaust. Atheists ask me all the time, if God's so good, why did the Holocaust happen? The Holocaust had a beginning, it had a middle, and it had an end. It is finite, temporal, transitory. The world that we are looking for is eternal. The world that we are heading for is eternal. It has no end. Now, second part of the Job story. The important part. Why the suffering? Why so much sickness, sadness, and sorrow in this world? Okay, good question. So Job is a good man and it happens to him. But it only happens up to the point that God allows it and no further. Now Job gets really tormented by the fact that God has allowed so much sickness and so much sorrow. So he goes up to God and this is the whole point of the book. He meets God face to face. And God doesn't answer him. He answers him in a question. He says, were you there when I created the foundation of the universe? In other words, do you have any idea what you're talking about? No. Were you there when I laid the foundation of the universe? Do you have any idea of any of it? No. Ignorance. And Job sees the perfection and the holiness and the beauty of God, the perfection of the execution and the perfection of the actual God. And he says, you know what? I repent in dust and ashes and 